Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle, and I'm a master's student working with Dr. Lindsay Robinson at the University of Guelph. Today, I'm excited to share with you some of our most recent data looking at the potential of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids to mitigate obese adipose tissue inflammation. This is a topic of major concern because the inflammation that underlies expanding adipose tissue drives the development of chronic diseases, in particular type 2 diabetes. You see, in lean, healthy adipose tissue, there are adipocytes and immune cells that work together to maintain normal adipose tissue function as a storage depot for excess energy in response to postprandial insulin. Then, when we overeat, that is, during times of excess energy consumption, immune cells are recruited to and infiltrate adipose tissue to help it to expand and remodel itself. That in itself is a normal, healthy process, but the problem in obesity is that our adipose tissue cannot keep up with the persistent demand to increase its storage capacity, and so this process of immune cell infiltration becomes uncontrolled. Those immune cells and adipocytes within adipose tissue also secrete protein signaling molecules called adipokines, and they use these to communicate with each other. But this too becomes dysregulated in obesity, such that obese adipose tissue is characterized by um, increased secretion of inflammatory adipokines. I'll focus today on tumor necrosis factor alpha, monocyte chemotractin protein 1, and interleukins 6 and 1 beta. Among those adipose tissue infiltrating immune cells, CD8 T cells are the first to accumulate, and they play a critical role in the recruitment of macrophages. Macrophages then polarize to the M1 inflammatory phenotype, and in turn, those M1 macrophages further contribute and exacerbate the inflammatory microenvironment within obese adipose tissue. Collectively, this obese adipose tissue inflammation contributes to its dysfunction in response to insulin, which then leads to a state of local and whole body insulin resistance, the precursor to type 2 diabetes which currently affects about 2 million Canadians, with another 1.5 million expected five years from now, by 2020. And that number really isn't all that shocking, considering that in a 10-year gap between 1998 to 2008, the prevalence nearly doubled. Now, if I haven't convinced you of, se of the severity of type 2 diabetes yet, I think that we can all agree that we are all inevitably aging. And in fact, the prevalence of and our risk of developing type 2 diabetes only increases with age. Not to mention, it is the sixth leading cause of death in Canada, but not before taking about $2.5 billion from our pockets. And so, our lab is tasked with, look, with trying to better understand the key players that contribute to the early processes in obesity in hopes of one day mitigating the downstream complications. My project in particular focuses on the role of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which signals through its cell membrane receptor to its downstream intermediates which, for one, impair normal insulin signaling and therefore normal adipocyte and thus adipose tissue function. TNF-alpha signaling also leads to the activation of transcription factors that also contribute and exacerbate obese adipose tissue inflammation, thus initiating this vicious cycle that links obesity to type 2 diabetes. More specifically, my project focuses on the role of TNF-alpha as part of the inflammatory crosstalk between CD8 T cells and adipocytes as a potential early target in obesity for intervention with dietary long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, which can be found in their natural marine sources as well as in supplemental forms and in functional foods. In fact, we recently reported that long-chain omega-3 fatty acids serve to attenuate the inflammatory crosstalk between CD8 T cells and adipocytes. However, the role of specific adipokines within this context, such as TNF-alpha, as well as the ensuing effect on recruited macrophages, remain to be elucidated. And that leads me to the objectives of my work, uh, which was to further study the role of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids in the mitigating CD8 T cell adipocyte adipokine-mediated inflammatory crosstalk, and then to investigate the ensuing effects on macrophage polarization status. I hypothesized that the anti-inflammatory actions of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids were, at least in part, attributable to the downregulation of TNF-alpha signaling, and both of those strategies would then serve to downregulate the expression of macrophage M1 polarization markers. To study this, we fed male and female mice for five weeks one of two isocaloric diets that were matched in fat content, either a control diet composed of safflower oil or a long-chain omega-3 fatty acid-enriched diet composed of Manhattan fish oil. 
Importantly, that fish oil enriched diet provided about 1.7% of energy as EPA and DHA per day. And just to put that into context, the World Health Organization recommends 0.5 to 2% of energy per day coming from omega-3 fatty acids. The diets did not differ in terms of initial or final body weight, nor in food intake per day, and we confirmed CD8 T cell enrichment of omega-3 fatty acids by gas chromatography. I used our recently established in vitro cell culture model that, 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 that mimics obese adipose tissue, wherein we purified splenic CD8 T cells and co-cultured them with 3T301 murine adipocytes for 24 hours. Importantly, these cell types were co-cultured at a 10% CD8 T cell to adipocyte ratio, and this mimics the degree of CD8 T cell infiltration into obese adipose tissue as reported in high-fat diet-fed mice. To even further recapitulate obese adipose tissue inflammation, we stimulated our co-cultures with a concentration of lipopolysaccharide that again has been reported in obesity. Finally, a subset of our control co-cultures were treated with a neutralizing antibody against TNF-alpha, and this allowed us to compare the anti-inflammatory effects of the fish oil enriched diet to TNF-alpha neutralization. This model allowed for us to investigate cell contact dependent crosstalk between CD8 T cells and adipocytes, but to further satisfy our objective of investigating adipokine mediated crosstalk between the cell types, we repeated this, these co culture conditions, but this time in a cell contact independent, um, a cell contact independent system, wherein the CD8 T cells and adipocytes were co cultured, but separated by a transwell membrane, permeable to only those secreted factors such as adipokines. This model also allowed for investigation into adipocyte-specific effects of CD8 T cell adipocyte crosstalk, as the cell types could be separated at the 24-hour mark. And on that note, at 24 hours, conditioned media was collected from all of our co-cultures for analysis of secreted adipokines, and all cells were harvested for analysis of gene expression. We will start with results from the cell contact dependent co-cultures, where CD8 T cells and adipocytes were, were touching in order to um, produce adipokines and communicate that way. We will look at the uh, relative gene expression between the control diet and the fish oil enriched diet of those inflammatory adipokines that we discussed earlier. As you can see, in almost every case, the fish oil enriched diet served to downregulate the expression of inflammatory adipokines. And then this was, um, this was also shown in secreted protein levels of MCP1 and IL-6. Interestingly, when we added that anti-TNF-alpha antibody to the control co-cultures, we saw a similar effect as we did in fish oil, wherein the anti-TNF-alpha antibody downregulated the expression of the inflammatory adipokines, and this again um, was translated to the secreted protein level, suggesting that the downregulation of TNF-alpha signaling within CD8 T cell adipocyte crosstalk could be one mechanism by which long-chain omega-3 fatty acids is working when the cells are in contact. Importantly, we did also show similar trends as this, wherein uh, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids were anti-inflammatory, as well as the anti-TNF-alpha treatment. We showed those as well in co-cultures uh, derived from high-fat diet-fed obese animals. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to continue to show you the data that we collected from our lower-fat-fed mice instead. The anti-inflammatory effects of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids were still evident even when the cells were not in contact. So in the CD8 T cells and adipocytes were separated by that transwell membrane. This extended to both the level of gene expression and protein secretion. And again, and, and sorry, however, when we added the anti-TNF-alpha antibody to these co-cultures, we did not see the same anti-inflammatory effect as we did in the contact-dependent co-cultures neither at the level of gene expression or protein secretion, suggesting when the cells are not in contact that the downregulation of TNF-alpha signaling is not, um, is, is not contributing to the anti-inflammatory effects of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids. From here, our next step was to investigate how CD8 T cell adipocyte crosstalk affects macrophage polarization status. To do this, we cultured marine macrophages in conditioned media collected from our co-cultures. Again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on the conditioned media that we collected from our contact-dependent co-cultures because that best recapitulates the in vivo scenario. We harvested the macrophages at six hours for analysis of early changes in gene expression. 
And consistent with our data collected from our CD8 T cell adipocyte co-cultures, the fish oil enriched diet served to downregulate the expression of macrophage M1 polarization markers, including inducible nitric oxide synthase and the familiar TNF alpha and IL1 beta. Interestingly, the fish oil enriched diet also served to increase the expression of IL10 and transforming growth factor beta, which are two adipokines that serve to downregulate inflammation. Also consistent with our, uh, with our CD8 T cell adipocyte co-culture data, when we added the anti-TNF alpha treatment to those co-cultures, we also saw similar effects when that condition media was put onto macrophages, wherein the anti-TNF alpha treatment served to downregulate the expression of macrophage M1 polarization markers, and again, this extended to an increased expression in the regulatory adipokines IL-10 and TGF beta suggesting that the downregulation of TNF-alpha signaling mediated by long-chain omega-3 fatty acids can then serve to downregulate macrophage M1 polarization. So, taken together, we have confirmed the anti-inflammatory effects of long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. And our data suggests that such anti-inflammatory effects on CD8 T-cell adipocyte crosstalk are mediated through the downregulation of TNF-alpha signaling. As I have just showed you, <coughs> excuse me, I have just showed you that both of those strategies lead to the downregulation of um, inflammatory adipokine gene expression as well as secreted protein levels, as well as macrophage M1 polarization markers. Thus, overall, our data supports CD8 T cell adipocyte crosstalk as an early target in obesity for intervention with dietary long chain omega 3 fatty acids. Uh, which would then theoretically attenuate the development of obese adipose tissue uh, dysfunction to then attenuate the, down, the, the downstream development of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. This theory then leads me to our next and current step of analysis, looking at um, CD8 T cell adipocyte crosstalk as a potential target, early target in an obesity to help to maintain insulin sensitivity as obesity progresses. Also, as you can imagine, with our observed anti-inflammatory effects of the long-chain omega-3 fatty acid-enriched diet, as well as the anti-TNF-alpha treatment, we are interested to learn if the combination of those two strategies would help to provide any further benefit in mitigating the, um, the early stages of obesity and its downstream metabolic complications. With that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to my advisor, Dr. Lindsay Robinson, for her unwavering support and encouragement. Um, also to my lab mates and mentors who have helped me in far more ways than one. And finally to our most generous collaborators, Dr. David Ma and Dr. Krista Power, as well as their labs. All of this work was certainly a team effort and I've been lucky enough to be part of a great one. Thank you all and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I noticed you fed a uh, mixture of EPA and DHA. Do you, based on, there's quite a lot known about the anti, in other systems, mm -hmm. the anti-inflammatory. So do you think it's a combination of EPA and DHA or EPA or DHA that is having that effect? Sure, yeah. That's a great question. And actually, we just completed um, a study relevant to that. Um, this was, again, in an in vitro cell culture model, and it was just in adipocytes this time, but we treated those adipocytes with, uh, with, with plant uh, fatty acids, ALA and LA, as well as the downstream uh, metabolites, AA, EPA, DHA, and the combination of EPA and DHA. Um, and just as kind of, in a nutshell, in, in those results, we found that while EPA was certainly anti-inflammatory, as was the combination of EPA and DHA, it was actually DHA that was most anti-inflammatory. Um, in that context, and, and it was kind of, if you can picture it, it was kind of EPA, EPA plus DHA, DHA, suggesting that it was particularly DHA, um, at least in that model, and so if I could translate, I would say that it is more so DHA. Um, and then on that topic, when we did gas chromatography on the diet that we fed these mice with, EPA and DHA are actually matched, um, so suggesting that there, there is enough DHA to promote such an effect. Uh, by gas chromatography? In the diet? Did you see the, no, in the cell, did EPA go to DPA? Uh, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I wish I could tell you, but I'm really not sure. Good question, though. 
Danielle, I, I thought the differentiation between contact and non-contact was, was really interesting. I'm, I'm just wondering if you can expand on the rationale and what you thought might happen, because obviously you didn't see maybe quite a difference between those mm -hmm. two, and obviously contact is going to be what's happening in vivo. Right. So yeah. I just wonder if you can again just explain for me just the rationale be behind the non-contact and maybe what you might have expected there. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, that is an, an important question because you're right, it, isn't, it definitely doesn't uh, translate into, into the body. Our objective was to look at adipokine mediated interactions and so we certainly could see that when the cells were in contact but we weren't able to, <clears throat> excuse me, we weren't able to differentiate if the contact there was because the cells were directly communicating because they were, their, their um, membranes were in contact or if it was through their secreted adipokines. So <clears throat> Pardon me. Separating them allowed us to see exactly what they were secreting, number one, and if what they were secreting was affecting the other cell type, and more importantly, if um, if omega-3, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids could still downregulate inflammation even if the cells weren't in contact, and that would suggest that they were downregulating inflammation from, at least in part, a secreted adipokine uh, perspective. So thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this amazing opportunity to present my results today uh, in uh, Winnipeg. It's very special for me to, uh, to come here today because three years ago, Winnipeg gave me my first chance as a PhD student, and that was my first uh, oral presentation, so I'm very grateful to, uh, to stand here again uh, today. So as you may know, uh, today we're going to talk about omega-3 fatty acids, nutrigenetics, and uh, as you may know, and glycemic, fact, uh, glycemic controls. So type 2 diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular diseases are major uh, public health concerns uh, worldwide, especially here in North America, uh, where uh, we uh, estimate that uh, the, uh, the prevalence will be uh, uh, of 40 million people that are going to be affected by uh, 2030. So um, previous work from our laboratory that we've published in the, the Gene Journal in uh, 2013 have shown that there is a big inter-individual variability uh, that is shown in uh, the um, insulin sensitivity response after a pre-post fish oil supplementation. So as you may uh, see in uh, the figure below is that uh, there is approximately 50% of the people uh, that decrease their uh, insulin sensitivity after uh, the uh, the fish oil supplementation, while we, we observe an increase of uh, the insulin sensitivity in 50% uh, of uh, the, the people. So it's 50-50 uh, in this case. Uh, I'm going uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, genes that uh, we uh, we have chosen because uh, it is related uh, to uh, to insulin sensitivity so it's the free fatty acid receptor 4 uh, FFAR4 uh, commonly referred to the G protein couple receptor uh, 120 so I'm going to talk about uh, about it uh, by uh, naming it, uh, naming it GPR120. So this is a gene encoding for protein that acts as a receptor for free fatty acids and uh, that mediates a potent anti-inflammatory and uh, insulin sensitizing effects. And potent GPR120 ligands include omega-3 uh, fatty acids and uh, especially very long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids such as EPA and DHA. So it has been shown that uh, N3 fatty acid uh, induced GPR120 stimulation and that may preserve uh, islet function to prevent insulin resistance. So, uh, however, Jersel uh, and colleagues uh, has published uh, an article in PLOS ONE in, two, uh, in 2014 uh, on GPR120 uh, deficient mice and have concluded that GPR120 appears to be dispensable for the improved metabolic profile associated with intake of omega-3. So we wanted to, uh, to see if that's the case uh, in human. <clears throat> so our hypothesis are, is uh, that carriers of uh, minor alleles of GPR120 single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs have deleterious glycemic controls following a fish oil supplementation. And the aim of the study is to test whether those SNPs are associated with glycemic controls uh, in, uh, the, in human uh, following uh, the supplementation. So to do so, we have genotyped 12 uh, SNPs in the GPR120 uh, 
gene covering at least 95% of the common genetic uh, area. And uh, we did it by uh, using the Tacman uh, technology. We use also the uh, Aplo view uh, to, uh, determine, uh, to determine the tag SNP using a minor LL frequency of uh, higher, uh, greater or equal to 5% and with a, pair, a pairwise tagging of 0 0.8. So uh, briefly, the methods of uh, our interventional study. Uh, there was the, a screening uh, period where uh, we, uh, we took blood sample of uh, our study uh, participants to verify their eligibility. So the inclusion criteria included to be aged between 18 and 50 years old, to have a BMI uh, comprised between uh, 25 and 40 kilo, uh, kilograms per meter squared, to be non-smokers, and to be free of any metabolic disorders. And we excluded partic study participants if they had taken entry PUFA uh, prior to uh, in the six uh, in the last six months, and if their triglyceride levels were above uh, four minimal per liter. After there was a two-week uh, run-in period where uh, we administered a 91 item uh, food frequency uh, questionnaire and uh, where uh, a registered dietitian uh, gave uh, some uh, dietary uh, instruction or dietary advices to uh, our study participants. After, there was the uh, supplementation period of six weeks. Uh, we, uh, we gave them uh, entry fatty acid capsules. So each participant had to take uh, five capsules a day. Each capsule is uh, one gram of fish oil, so for a total of five grams a day. And uh, it provided them with 3.3 grams of EPA and DHA combined. And at the end of the intervention, there was a compliance questionnaire. So uh, all gen type distribution uh, of uh, the, the SNPs from GPR120 were uh, tested uh, uh, for any deviation from the RD Weinberg equilibrium using the LL procedure in SAS Genetic 9.3. And we use mixed procedure for repeated measures uh, to, uh, to test for possible gene diet interaction. And uh, those uh, statistical models were adjusted for the effect of age, sex, and BMI. And since uh, SNPs uh, tested in complex diseases are uh, ra rarely account for a large proportion of the variance, uh, results are thus presented without correction for multiple, uh, multiple testing. So here uh, in the result, uh, I'm going to show you the baseline characteristic of our study. Uh, simple. So uh, basically, uh, the, uh, our uh, participants were a little bit overweight with a BMI of 27.8. As expected, men uh, are a little bit uh, more heavy than women. And um, a woman had a higher uh, HDL cholesterol and higher CRP levels, while men had a, a higher um, total cholesterol and HDL ratio and higher triglyceride levels. So here are the uh, four uh, gene diet interaction on insulin uh, levels according to uh, uh, several SNPs from the GPR120 uh, area. So uh, what you could see from uh, those uh, four figures are that uh, carriers of the mutated allele um, uh, decrease their insulin levels after the supplementation. And here is the gene diet interaction with uh, the insulin sensitivity um, OMA index values. Uh, so it's all it's the same. So here, as you can see, uh, the minor alleles, uh, the carriers of the minor allele, uh, decrease their uh, their insulin sensitivity OMA index values after the supplementation. So this is the the fifth one. And there was no gene diet uh, interaction on fasting glucose uh, levels, only on insulin and on insulin sensitivity. So uh, as I told you earlier, GPR120 is a protein coding, uh, coding gene. And the encoded protein uh, acts as a receptor for entry fatty acid and mediates a potent uh, anti-inflammatory effect. And uh, this is uh, particularly seen in macrophages and in adipocytes. It mediates also a potent uh, insulin sensitizing effect and anti-diabetic effects uh, by uh, repressing macrophage-induced tissue inflammation. So in the present study, we observed several gene diet interaction with uh, glycemic controls, as I, I told you earlier. So five gene diet interaction with the insulin sensitivity and four gene uh, diet interaction for the insulin uh, levels.
and uh, SNP in the GPR120 have been previously associated with lung cancer in the literature, with insulin resistance also, and with uh, obesity threat, uh, mainly with uh, BMI uh, levels uh, in a Japanese uh, population. So uh, in the present study, carriers of the mutated allele of GPR120 SNPs have increased their fasting insulin levels and decreased their uh, insulin sensitivity values after the six-week supplementation. So as you may know, entry PUFA represents a reasonable therapeutic uh, strategy to improve the dyslipidemic profile uh, in individuals uh, with type 2 diabetes. So the binding of omega-3 fatty acids to uh, GPR120 is associated with various uh, physiological activities that have, been, uh, that have a stabilizing effect on uh, metabolic homeostasis. So uh, it has been implicated in the regulation of energy uh, metabolism with anti-inflammatory effect, uh, with uh, the relief of uh, insulin resistance by enabling the uh, adipogenesis in adipose and liver tissues, uh, with the maintenance of insulin sensitivity through uh, the inhibition of uh, the inflammation in uh, macrophages, uh, with the pancreatic uh, beta cells also uh, survival and proliferation, and with the stimulation of the pancreatic insulin uh, secretion via GLP-1 and CCK. So all uh, of this is being related to uh, glycemic controls. And uh, as we may know is uh, that unsaturated fatty acids are ligands of GPR120, but uh, entry fatty acids appears to be more potent than omega-6 and uh, omega-9 in uh, stimulating uh, the, the protein. Um, and DHA appears also to be uh, the, uh, the best agonist of GPR120. So, um, we uh, have uh, shown in a previous study that has just been accepted uh, for publication, it's written submitted, but it has been accepted yesterday, uh, that DHA levels in our uh, population uh, increase uh, in plasma phospholipid um, for 42.6% uh, uh, after the six-week uh, supplementation. And since this is the best agonist, uh, it, uh, it may explain why we observe several gene diet interaction on insulin and insulin sensitivity. And also, all the N6 um, fatty acid levels have uh, measured in plasma phospholipid have decreased in our study, in addition to uh, alpha-linolenic fatty acid, while all very long-chain fatty acid uh, levels uh, have increased, so uh, EPA, DPA, and DHA. So uh, uh, a key strength of this study is that uh, it was an interventional study with high doses of uh, omega-3. It would also have been interesting uh, to use an OGTT uh, and uh, to measure the uh, insulin secretion um, by dosing the C-peptide to get uh, accurate measures of glycemic uh, controls. The actual uh, study does not allow us to go further, um, sadly, in the analysis of glycemic control pyramid parameters, suggesting that uh, more studies uh, will be needed to uh, better on this, understand the impact of GPR-120 SNPs on diabetes risk. So uh, to, conclu to conclude, we have shown that uh, several uh, SNPs in the GPR120 gene uh, may modulate plasma insulin uh, levels and insulin sensitivity, uh, possibly leading to a worsened metabolic profile in carriers uh, of the mutated alleles. And uh, the magnitude of changes uh, varies substan uh, substantially among individuals, as I, uh, I shown you earlier with uh, the uh, inter-individual variability figure uh, in my introduction. So meaning that what is good at a population level is not necessarily good as a, an individual level. So a better understanding of this uh, phenomenon could allow uh, the development of personalized dietary advice for the management of cardiometabolic risk factors uh, and the, uh, in diabetes. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Marie-Claude Vol, which is my, uh, my PI, also all the staff of the Clinical Investigation Unit at HINAF, the coordinators of the study and the research assistant, and I would like to thank the CIHR for uh, funding uh, this research program and for my studentship. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'd like to thank the World Committee for giving me this great opportunities um, to present a section of my study regarding the mechanisms responsible for cholesterol lowering effect for beta glucan. Beta glucan is a major soluble fiber in barley. This polysaccharide consists of beta D glucose units joined by 1,3 and 1,4 glucosidic bands. 
Of the main cereals we consume, barley contains high levels of beta-glucan. The cholesterol lowering effect of beta-glucan has been well documented. The health claim that a daily intake of three grams beta-glucan from oats or barley can actively, actively reduce cholesterol levels has been approved by several regulatory agencies around the world. That includes FDA in US, IFSA in Europe, um, FASANS in Australia and New Zealand, and also Health Canada in Canada. Beyond the effective dose of three grams per day, there's strong evidence suggests that basic chemical properties of beta-glucan in terms of molecular weight and viscosity play critical roles in his cholesterol lowering effect. A study done by Voliver showed a linear regression between the LDL reduction at the end of the beta-glucan intervention and the log viscosity. They also showed that high molecular weight beta-glucan and medium molecular weight beta-glucan lowered cholesterol, but the low molecular weight beta-glucan did not lower cholesterol levels. The mechanisms responsible for the cholesterol lowering effect of beta-glucan has been proposed, but less demonstrated. Cholesterol homeostasis is determined by dietary cholesterol um, absorption, de novo cholesterol synthesis, and also cholesterol elimination, mainly through converting cholesterol to bioacids. The function of bioacids is assisting fat absorption in the small intestine. Majority of bioacids are absorbed back to the liver, and very small amount is lost with through feces. Beta-glucan, due to his viscosity, may be able to inhibit cholesterol absorption in the small intestine lumen. It may also interact with bowel acids to inhibit class a bowel acid reabsorption. So that more bowel acids are needed to be converted from cholesterol, and subsequently more cholesterol could be consumed from the circulation. Beta-glucan is fermentable. The bowel products resulting from the fermentation are thought to be able to decrease cholesterol synthesis. So in, in summary, three, three mechanisms have been proposed. Um, decreasing cholesterol absorption, decreasing cholesterol synthesis, and also increasing cholesterol elimination through interrupting bile acids into a hepatic circulation. Our previous study showed that consume beta-glucan, specifically three grams high molecular weight beta-glucan, increased bile acid synthesis compared to the control, but did not affect cholesterol absorption. You probably heard about SUBSA1 from uh, the presentation, presentation from Hamad yesterday. Um, seven, uh, sub seven one our seven alpha hydroxylase, uh, cholesterol seven alpha hydroxylase, is a rate limiting enzyme in the classical pathway of bile acid synthesis. The SNP RS3808607, located at the promoter region of the encoding gene, and this SNP um, has relatively high minor allele frequency. T alleles and G alleles dis distributed almost like half, half and half in the general population. Um, this SNP has been associated with different responses to plant sterols. A study done by Dylan Michael from Dr. Jones Group showed that G allele carriers responded to beta responded to plant sterol um, in low in cholesterol levels, but TT carriers did not respond. And this gene, SUBSA1, is primarily important in the cholesterol and also bowel acid synthesis, and is closely related to the proposed mechanisms I have just showed. So the question is, is this SNP also associated with cholesterol lowering uh, effect of um, beta-glucan will respond differently or not? 
So to summarize the rationale, our results have shown that consuming beta-glucan increased bile acids, but did not affect cholesterol absorption. And how about cholesterol synthesis? And additionally, um, is any of these mechanisms associated with the SNAP substance of A1 or not? Our objectives were to determine if beta-glucan reduce serum cholesterol levels through inhibiting cholesterol synthesis, and also to determine whether the underlying mechanisms are associated with genetic variation, variants of sub 71 um, SNP. We conducted a four-phase randomized and also crossover trial. 30 volunteers with mildly high cholesterol levels received barley breakfast containing three grams or five grams low molecular weight beta-glucan, um, and also three grams high molecular, mo high molecular weight beta-glucan, and also a rice and um, wheat based on control. The intervention period was five weeks. The washout was four weeks. We collected blood samples at the beginning and the end of, um, of each phase. We also gave heavy water at the end of the phase um, for determine the cholesterol synthesis rate. Here are the characteristics of the treatment diet. High molecular weight beta-glucan um, has much higher viscosity compared to the low molecular weight beta-glucan and the control. And here are the fancy barley breakfast we provide to the volunteers. And in this full feeding study, energy intake and micronutrients were controlled. We determined blood lipid profiles by autoanalyzer. Um, the fract fractional rate of cholesterol synthesis uh, yeah, was assessed by measuring uh, the incorporation rate of deuterium derived from um, heavy water within the body water pool to the red, into the red blood cells um, cholesterol pool over 24 hours. Uh, we do not have substance one SNP by the Techman IC. Our results showed that three grams high molecular weight beta-glucan reduced the total cholesterol compared to the control, but not any of the low molecular weight beta-glucan. For the changes of um, LDL, um, there, there was no um, statistic, statistically difference. P-value was 0.07. We also observed um, the genetic variance of SEP1 is associate, was associated with different responses to beta-glucan intervention. GLL carriers, uh, in GLL carriers, with the increase of viscosity, TC reduction and LDL, LDL reduction um, increased. However, this linear relationship was not observed in the TT allele carriers. Cholesterol synthesis did not change um, by beta glucan consumption. Bring back our previous results. Beta glucan consumption did not change cholesterol absorption, but increased bile acid synthesis. Further, we divided the volunteers based on their genotypes of sub 71 and we didn't see any differences of these subgroups for cholesterol absorption and cholesterol synthesis. And we have seen um, in all the volunteers, bioacid synthesis increased, and this result small pronounced in the GG allele carriers. So this result indicating the presence of G allele, especially for the homozygous GG, um, made the individuals more responsive or sensitive to the high viscosity of beta-glucan. So in conclusion, inhibition of cholesterol synthesis is not a mechanism for the cholesterol lowering effect of beta-glucan. High molecular weight beta-glucan consumption lowers T total cholesterol and increases class bile acid synthesis through a function of SNAP of sub-71. 
Our study elucidated the mechanism through a comprehensive approach. We covered all the three proposed mechanisms, and we also uh, connected the phenotype of, of mechanisms through the related genetic variants. Uh, we do have a relatively small sample size for each of the genotype groups. Um, so we hope to see future study with lar larger sample size to confirm our findings. Also, we need the evidence from molecular level to support uh, the connection between the genotype to phenotype. I would like to thank my advisors, Dr. Nancy Ames and Dr. Peter Jones, and my um, advisory committee, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Alpha, and Dr. Kahathipo, the technicians who helped the study, and also Dr. Peter Eck and Dr. Gamo, who contributed to the study. I would also like to thank um, my group members, especially Muhammad and Dylan. Uh, you have been very supportive to me through my PhD training. Um, uh, lastly, I'd like to thank Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to fund, for funding the study and also um, my PhD program. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this great opportunity today to present my part of my PhD result. Uh, so to introduce you to uh, our research topic uh, in our laboratory, we are interested in the topic of cognitive decline. We know that there are numerous risk, uh, factors that can influence positively or negatively the risk of developing cognitive decline, namely physiological, environmental, and genetic. The most important risk factor for developing CD is aging. However, we're interested on other factors, namely fatty fish consumption, which is rich in the omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, is associated with a lower risk of developing CD. On the other hand, being a carrier of the apolipoprotein E epsilon 4, that I'll call APOE4 from now on, is the most important genetic risk factor for developing cognitive decline known to date. What's interesting is that APOE4 carriers do not seem to gain the same cognitive benefits from fatty fish consumption compared to the non-carriers. So we asked ourselves, is it because of a dysfunction on DHA metabolism? So Professor Plourde in 2008 uh, performed a pilot study in which she gave three gram per day supplement of EPA plus DHA for six weeks to LT participants. They evaluated the DHA plus RMA response, delta DHA, to the supplement in carriers and non-carriers of APOE4. We defined delta DHA as the relative percent of DHA after the supplement minus the relative percent before the supplement. And the it's in percent of the total fatty acids. So here, in plasma triglyceride, you see in color APOE4 carriers, non-colors, non-carriers, uh, the, the plasma response to DHA. Uh, you see that APOE4 carriers responded uh, responded about 50% to that of the response of the APOE4 non-carriers. So carriers are lower responders to a supplement of DHA, so we wanted to better characterize this situation. So for my master, I administered a single oral dose of uniformly labeled carbon-13 DHA. Uh, since all carbons on the DHA are 13, it's a stable isotope and it's possible for us to follow its metabolism. So. I followed its kinetic for 28 days before and also after a five-month supplement of EPA plus DHA to evaluate the diet effect also. So before the supplement, we have similar results from the previous study. So you have the concentration of 13C DHA on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. That's a repeated measure handover for the statistical analysis. You see in red that the APOE4 carriers uh, show, show the lower incorporation of 13C DHA compared to the non-carriers. However, we have reason to believe that a long-term supplement, five months of three gram per day EPA plus DHA, could rebalance DHA homeostasis in carriers of APOE4. Indeed, when you look after the supplement, uh, the genotype effect that we were seeing before does not show for the kinetic study of the 13C DHA after the, the supplement. So if we can reestablish DHA homeostasis, this might have repercussion on cognition. So what we did for my PhD project is we evaluated uh, with a model of mice knocked in for human APOE, uh, we, we, we hypothesis that a long-term diet rich in DHA will prevent the cognitive deficits that are seen in mice carrying this genotype, the APOE4 genotype. And the objective is with this model of mice to evaluate the potential gene by diet interaction on cognition. So 
to perform this test, this study, I went uh, to, to be trained at Schull at Université Laval in Professor Frédéric Callon's laboratory for five months. Uh, so here you have the age span of the mice for the project. At the age of four months, we administered either one of the three diets that are here, control diet, high fat, or DHA diet. We added the third diet, the high fat, to better extrapolate our results with what we see in consumption and di dietary consumption in humans. Uh, with regards to the macronutrient composition, you see that the control and DHA diet are fairly similar. However, the DHA diet, in, the, in the DHA diet, we added 0.5 gram per 100 gram of diet of DHA. At the end of the, uh, of the 12 months, I performed spatial and visual memory evaluation. Today, I'll present you two tests. The first test is the spatial memory test. It's the Barnes maze. It's fairly similar to the Morris water maze. It, it, it lasts five days. Uh, the objective of this test is to induce a stress to the mice so that the mice will want to, uh, to escape the stress. So you deposit the mice in the middle of a round table. There are 20 compartments around the table, but only one compartment is a real escape hole. So you induce a stress by ways of 80 decibel constant noise and bright light, so the mice will try and escape. What you do is you do the, the test from day to four, four trials per day, so the mice should be learning where is the real compartment because we never move the table and the mice also has visual clues around the table. So we do four trials per day, 180 second maximum of exploration, and we measure errors and escape latency. I'll present to you today the, the results of escape latency. So for these, we perform general linear model with time as repeated measure in SPSS, basically a repeated measure ANOVA again. You have the escape latency and the days. In color, you see that APOE4 mice under the control diet took significantly longer to find the maze, even though both genotypes had clearly a learning. Uh, we, we saw learning there. Uh, similar results for the IFAT diet. The APOE4 mice took longer to find the, the, comp the, the escape compartment. However, on the DHA diet, uh, we no longer see a genotype effect between the two, uh, between APOE4 and APOE3. So what it tells us is that APOE4 mice present spatial memory deficit, but DHA diet at least partly prevents those deficits. The other test, the visual memory, is the object recognition test. It's a modified version of the novelty test that is known uh, in animal behavioral uh, community. Uh, it was uh, standardized in Professor Callon's laboratory. It, it lasts two times five minutes. You have a conditioning phase where you deposit the mice and it looks at two cubes. And then you wait 60 minutes and you redo the same test. What you measure is the, the, the time of interest that the mice has for each object. During the test, you change one of the cubes for a cylinder. By doing this, the mice should have more interest for the cylinder since it's a novel object. So we measure the total duration of interest for the cylinder on the total duration of interest for both objects. This gives us a recognition index, which is going to be between 0 and 1. If it's significantly higher than 0.5, that means that the mice recognize the cylinder. So for the results, you have the index, the genotypes in the diet, HF is high fat, DHA is DHA. Uh, for the APOE3 mice, you see that under both control and DHA diet, they recognize the, uh, the cylinder. Whereas for the APOE4 mice, uh, only the ones exposed to the DHA diet recognize the cylinder. To analyze statistically those uh, results, we performed one sample t-test with the 0.5 values as a theoretical mean. So our APOE4 mice have visual and spatial memory deficits. What about DHA homeostasis? We have results today for uh, plasma and liver. So uh, I have the concentration of DHA with regards to the genotypes and diet. You see in the plasma that under control or IFAT diet, we don't have any difference between APOE4 mice and APOE3 mice. However, under the DHA diet, the uh, APOE4 mice have less DHA compared to APOE3. When you look at the liver, uh, what's interesting is that under the control diet, the APOE4 mice have more DHA, whereas under the DHA diet, similar results as plasma. I didn't explain to you how we thought that the incorporation of DHA was lower in APOE4 carriers in the introduction, but we have reason to believe that it goes through an increased beta oxidation of DHA. And we, we see in control that the APOE4 mice had more DHA in the liver. So diet influence APOE4 uh, mice levels of DHA, uh, so either lower or similar DHA in the blood. This is extrapolated to differential DHA also in the liver, 
What about the brain? We published recently a, a paper that showed that DHA in the brain of APOE4 mice under a deficient and, uh, DHA diet have lower levels of DHA in the brain. Um, but for the last four months, I've tried to look at uh, protein markers that are involved either in neurogenesis or in neurological homeostasis. So what we did is uh, I sampled seven regions of the brain. One of those regions, the biggest one, is the parietal temporal cortex. So what I did is I proceeded with protein extraction in Western blots. Uh, here I present you a schematic of a synapse. We looked at uh, three vesicular protein, uh, SNAP25, synaptophysin, and VGL1 that are all, all involved in neurotransmission. Uh, and I also looked at a scaffold protein, a postsynaptic PSD95. However, up until now, we have no uh, significantly, uh, significant difference between genotype or diet with regards to those mic markers. We wanted to look at those markers because in behavioral tests in mice and also in our model of mice, it has been shown that the, the changes with regards to cognition. However, we sampled the cortex, which is not necessarily the first region that is going to be affected in the context of cognitive decline. So next, we want to look at the hippocampus, but also at DHA levels. And, and we think that DHA is going to be lower uh, in APOE4 mice in the brain, but we hope that the DHA diet will narrow that gap. So in conclusion, our mice presented both spatial and visual memory deficits. If a long-term high-dose DHA diet can prevent those deficits, this could have repercussion in, in humans. Uh, maybe the APOE4 carriers will need personalized dose to actually uh, prevent uh, health problems. However, by which mechanism is still the question that we ask ourselves right now. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, research director, Professor Melanie Pleur, and Professor Frédéric Callan, and all collaborators and funding agency. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions?